when we get started, our next speaker is going to be Georgina Hall from Princeton, telling us about non-negative pronouns. Hi, everyone. Uh, so thanks very much for coming to my talk, and thank you for the invitation. So today I'm going to be talking about non-negative polynomials and applications to learning. So this is joint work with my advisor, who gave a talk here a few days ago, and uh, one of our senior thesis students, Mihaela. So I'm going to start with the basics, even though I'm aware that most of you know uh, this, this thing. So what is a non-negative polynomial? So a multivariate polynomial p in n variables, x1 for xn, is non-negative if p of x is greater or equal to 0 for any x in rn. So here I've drawn a univariate polynomial. It's obviously non-negative. But what if we're interested in showing that this kind of polynomial is non-negative? It's a much more complicated polynomial, and it's harder. So in fact, I'm interested in something even more than just checking non-negativity of a given polynomial. What I'm actually interested in are problems of the following type. So it's what I call optimizing over non-negative polynomials. So it's problems of the following form. So I have uh, a polynomial here. And the decision variables are the coefficients of my polynomial. I have an objective, which is linear, uh, in, the, in the coefficients of my polynomial, and constraints that are affine in the coefficients of my polynomial. And then I have this extra condition here, which is a non-negativity condition. And um, so you may wonder at this point, right? What, what is the, the point of these kind of problems? Uh, why would I be interested in problems of this type? So the most common application of problems of this type is polynomial optimization. But today I'm going to be telling you about two different problems in machine learning that can be cast as problems of this type. So I'm going to revisit them. This is just a brief introduction to each of them. So the first one is shape-constrained regression. So the problem I'm interested in here is I've got a bunch of data points, and I want to fit a polynomial regressor through these data points. And um, so that I minimize, for example, least squares. But um, on top of usual regression, what I wish to do is um, have some kind of shape constraint on this polynomial regressor. So this, for example, can be monotonicity in the features, or convexity, or concavity. So this makes sense in terms of applications. So the typical applications we have in mind are pricing applications. So for example, trying to determine the price of a car. So you can imagine if you have two cars where everything is fixed except for one feature, right, which is age, an older car should be uh, less expensive than a newer car. right? So we would have monotonicity in that feature. So we have ap other applications, for example, like interest rates for student loans. So this is where this would come into play in, in applications. And so how does this connect back to optimizing over non-negative polynomials? Well, here we want to fit a polynomial regressor to our data. And um, so the, the, the derivatives of this, poly of this polynomial are going to be polynomials again. And imposing monotonicity of um, our polynomial regressor over a range is the same as imposing non-negativity of its partial derivatives, which are polynomials over that range. And similarly, right, if you, have, if you want your polynomial regressor to be convex, right, Imposing convexity is the same thing as imposing that the Hessian of your polynomial at x be positive semi-definite. And if you, this is equivalent to asking that y transpose the Hessian of x times y is non-negative for any x and y. Here the Hessian is a matrix with polynomials entries, right? And when I multiply by y on either side, I'm going to get a polynomial in x and y. And I'm asking for this polynomial to be non-negative, right? So this is how it connects back to optimizing over non-negative polynomials. And the second uh, application I have in mind is difference of convex programs. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with um, these type of problems, so it's optimization problems with the following form. So you're minimizing some f0 of x, such that fi of x is less than or equal to 0. But here you have the extra constraint that these f0 fi's are written as a difference of two convex functions. Okay, So they can be written as gi of x minus hi of x. And gi and hi are convex here. So they, they appear uh, a lot in machine learning, these, these kind of problems. And um, a main problem that's been raised in the literature uh, over the past years has been, well, if we're given polynomials of this format, right? If we, can, if we know that these polynomials can be written as a difference of two convex polynomials, then we're all set. But what happens if we don't have a structure of this type? How can I obtain a structure of this type? So these are the two applications I'm going to be revisiting throughout my talk. I just wanted to give you a brief overview. So this one, how does this one connect back to uh, optimizing over non-negative polynomials? Again, it's the convexity, right? Imposing that gi and hi be convex is the same as imposing that y transpose the Hessian times y is non-negative. OK, so the outline of the rest of the talk, so I'm going to give a very, very brief introduction to sum of squares, just one slide to get everybody on the same page. Then I'm going to revisit these two uh, different applications. So just, I'm sure all of you know this, but um, 
uh, what is a sum squares polynomial. So testing whether a polynomial is non-negative is a hard thing to do when the degree of the polynomial is greater or equal to four. So a popular surrogate that's used for non-negative uh, polynomials is sum of squares polynomials, and it's a sufficient condition for non-negativity. And what we like about sum of squares polynomials is that essentially it's a tractable condition to test. So testing, optimizing over the set of sum of squares polynomials is a semi-definite program. Okay, so back to my two applications here. So I'm gonna start with monotone regression. So the setting is the following, okay? So we have n data points, um, xi, which is our feature vector, and yi, which is our response. And I'm gonna assume that we have an underlying function f here um, that generates these points yi. So yi is a noisy measurement of f at xi. So I add some noise here, epsilon i. I'm further gonna assume that uh, my feature vectors xi belong to a box b that's included in rn. And on top of all of this, I'm gonna assume that I have what we call a monotonicity profile for a function f. So what does this mean? This means that I know how my function f depends on my features. So this is a vector, right? An n by one vector. And each entry gives you how this function f depends on the current feature. So if I look at entry j, right, of this feature vector, if it's equal to one, it's because I know that my, my function f is monotonically increasing with respect to xj. If it's minus one, I know it's decreasing with respect to that variable. And if it's zero, it means um, that I don't, there's no monotonicity requirements with that particular feature. And so the goal of this part of the talk is to fit essentially a polynomial to the data that has the same monotonicity profile rho over my box B, okay? And so the two questions I have is, can this be done computationally? And uh, how good is this approximation? So is the setup clear? So um, the first result we have is a negative result in the sense that if I give you a cubic polynomial P, a box B, and a monotonicity profile rho, then it's actually hard to test whether this polynomial has that monotonicity profile over the box. Um, but we have an SOS relaxation of this problem. So say we want to impose, right, that our polynomial is increasing with respect to variable J. So what does that mean? It means that I want my polynomial to be non-negative. Uh, the, the, derivatives, the derivative of that polynomial with respect to that variable to be non-negative over the box. And so I just relax it. So if P has odd degree, I'm gonna relax it in this way. So I'm gonna require that my derivative of my polynomial with respect to xj be equal to a sum of squares polynomial plus a sum of sum of squares polynomial time this uh, quadratic polynomial here. So notice, right, that obviously when my xi belongs to my box, uh, this quadratic here is gonna be non-negative. I'm multiplying by a sum of squares, which is non-negative, and adding another sum of squares, which is non-negative again. So this gives me that when I belong to the box, essentially, uh, this polynomial, this derivative of this polynomial is gonna be non-negative. So this is indeed a relaxation of this, okay? And um, so now I'm gonna go on to approximation. So how good is our potential approximation? So we have the following result that tells us that if you give me any precision epsilon uh, greater than zero and any C1 function f that generates my, my points, uh, so this f has a monotonicity profile rho, then I can find for you a polynomial p that has the same profile as f uh, such that f and p don't differ too much over this box, and such that uh, the monotonicity profile of my polynomial can be satisfied using sum of squares. And so the proof of this theorem, I'm not gonna go into it, but it uses results from approximation theory and then uh, Putinas positive Stellen says. Richard? Yes. What about the degree of p? So yeah, that's a good question. So essentially, um, it's similar to, to all these, these, these theorems that we have, so the degree we're not, we don't have it, well, we have a, uh, an expression depending on, for example, the minimum of p over the box, which we don't know. So the bounds we can't we can't compute them. Yeah. Okay. So how does this perform in experiments? So here this is. So we have. So this is just a projection onto one particular feature. So this is actually a multivariate polynomial that we that we obtain with our regression, and we're projecting onto one particular feature. And with this feature, we know that uh, the function here is monotonous with respect to this feature. So this is the blue line here. This is the original function that we have. So that we're considering two different environments: the low noise environment and the high noise environment. And what we're doing is we're doing an unconstrained regression in pale orange here and here, and a constrained regression, a monotonically constrained regression in darker orange here. And as you can see, right, in the case of unconstrained regression, especially in the high noise environment, 
uh, you can see that we have a lot of overfitting going on, right? So this, this polynomial here, the unconstrained regression, overfits considerably. Whereas our uh, polynomial, because we're integrating this, this notion of you know, monotonicity, it's more robust and it follows more closely the original function. And so we generalize these uh, results um, on, on this particular figure here. So in this figure, what we're doing is we're testing, so we're training our model uh, over some, some data and then we're testing it. So this is again a low noise environment and this is a high noise environment. And you can see, so the training sets, so it's in yellow and in purple, the training when we, when we do this regression over the training sets. So obviously, right, the unconstrained version does better on training because it has this capacity to overfit. Um, but our model does better when it comes to the testing, right, because we have this additional information that uh, we're taking into consideration. Okay, so this is the testing. Uh, this is the testing, and in red, this is the testing here. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to difference of convex programming. Any questions on monotone regression? What was D? Oh, yeah, uh, so D is actually um, what's written. So it's the, the um, horizontal axis. Sorry, what, 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 what number of features? Yeah. Oh, D is the degree of the polynomial. Ah, the yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And the number of features here is like seven, I think. Okay, so now we're gonna, I'm going to revisit the difference of convex programming um, example. So just to remind you what the problem was. So I'm interested in problems of the following form, right? I'm interested in minimizing f0 of x such that fi of x is less than or equal to 0, where fi is this difference of two convex functions. And I'm going to restrict myself to the particular case where my functions are polynomials. And the question I'm interested in is if I'm not given a decomposition of this type, right, how would I obtain a decomposition of this type? So this boils down to the following question question, right? If I give you a polynomial f, can you give me back two convex polynomials g and h such that f is equal to g minus h? And at this point, you might have a lot of questions like, you know, does such a decomposition always exist? Um, can it be efficiently computed? Is it unique? So I'm going to answer all these questions in the second part of this talk. So the first question is about existence. And to understand existence, well, how I showed that such a decomposition does always exist, uh, you need to understand just briefly what um, being SOS convex is. So as I mentioned before, right, a polynomial f is convex, is equivalent to asking that y transpose its Hessian at x times y be non-negative for any x and y in Rn. Okay, so this is, we're asking that a polynomial in x and y be non-negative. So I can replace the non-negativity condition by a sum of squares condition. And so this is what we call, so f is SOS convex if um, this is satisfied, right? It's a sufficient condition for convexity. And what is nice about it is that it's checkable via SF mean definite programming. And so the theorem we actually have is the following. So if I give you any polynomial, you can give me back two SOS convex polynomials um, such that you know, f is equal to g minus h. And then as a corollary, as any SOS convex polynomial is a convex polynomial, this means that any polynomial can be written as a difference of two convex polynomials, okay? And so the proof of this theorem is actually um, more general, very easy to show. So um, the theorem, the general theorem is the following. So if you have a four dimensional cone over a vector space, then any element of your vector space can be written as the difference of two elements in the cone. So that's the more general theorem. And it's easy to show. So let's take a look at the proof. So I have my vector space E here. I have my cone K, right? It's four dimensional. And I have an element V that I want to decompose as the difference of two elements in the cone. So I have one element here, uh, which I take to be in the interior of K. I know such a thing exists, right? Because my cone is four dimensional. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw a line between V and K. And on this line, I know there's a point that's still in the cone because the cone is four dimensional that is neither K nor V. And this is simply what I write here in this equality. And then I just rearrange this equality and I obtain that my point V can be written as a non-negative scalar times an element in the cone minus a non-negative scalar times an element in the cone. So essentially it can be written as the difference of two elements in the cone. Okay. And how is this applied to our particular setup? Well, in our setup, right, we're interested in showing that any polynomial can be written as a difference of two SOS convex polynomials. So here I'm going to take my vector space to be the set of polynomials of degree 2D and in N variables. And I'm going to take my cone to be the set of SOS convex polynomials of degree 2D and in N variables. And I'm going to get the result that I wanted. I just need to show that my cone is four-dimensional. And this I can do by showing that sum of xi squared to the D uh, is in the interior of the cone. 
So this actually answers two questions, right? So it answers the existence question. We know that such a decomposition exists, and it also answers the efficient, how can we compute this um, question? Uh, we just need to solve a problem of this type, so we're going to solve the following problem. We're going to look for the coefficients of g and h such that f is equal to g minus h, and g and h are SOS convex, and this is going to be a semi-definite program. And we guarantee that such a problem is always going to be feasible, right, because we show that such a decomposition always exists. And in fact, in the paper, we showed that we can do this using linear programming or second-order cone programming, um, but I'm not going to discuss this here. Okay. So at this point, where are we at? So just as a reminder, right, we were interested in this question. If I give you a polynomial uh, f, can you find convex polynomials g and h such that f is equal to g minus h? Does such a decomposition always exist? Yes, right, we saw that it did. Can it be uh, computed efficiently? Yes, using SOS convexity. And then the last question is, is this decomposition unique? And quite trivially, the answer to this is no. So why is this? If I give you an initial decomposition, right, f is equal to g minus h, then I can add anything convex on the left hand side, subtract on the right hand side, and I get a completely new decomposition. So this begs the question as to what would be the best decomposition, right? I have an infinite number to pick from, and what would I pick as a best decomposition? So that really depends on what you want to do with this decomposition, right? So in our particular case, we're interested in solving problems of this type, these difference of convex programs. So um, what we're interested in is a decomposition that favors uh, heuristics for minimizing these kind of problems. And uh, the particular heuristic we're concerned with is a convex concave procedure, or CCP. So I'm going to explain how it works, and then I'm going to tell you what would be a good decomposition for this kind of um, heuristic. So the idea is very easy. So it's an iterative algorithm. So you start with an initial point, x0, and you have your decompositions, right, of these functions, fi into gi minus hi. So what do you do? Uh, you, you provide these convexified versions of your functions fi of x. So you convexify how? By keeping the convex part, gi of x, and by linearizing the concave part around the current iterate. Okay, so this gives you, so this part will be affine, uh, this part will be convex, and so the resulting function will be convex too. So what does this look like? So typically if you have a non-convex function here, its convexified version around the point x0 equals 2 is this orange curve here, okay? And then you solve the convex subproblem. So you replace every single fi in this uh, formulation here by its convexified version. This is a convex optimization problem. You solve it, and you get your next iterate, yeah. and you repeat. So on a toy example, what does this look like? So here I'm minimizing this function here. And I know that f can be written as g minus h. Um, and I'm going to start at the point x0 equals 2. I'm going to convexify my function around x0 equals 2. I'm going to get this orange curve here. I'm going to minimize this orange curve. I'm going to get x1. I'm going to convexify again around this blue curve, get x2, and so on and so forth. And eventually, I'm going to converge this local minimum. Okay, so what would it mean to pick a good decomposition for this algorithm, right? So the main idea in this algorithm is this linearizing part. So you have your decomposition, right? You linearize your concave part minus h of x uh, to obtain this convexified version of your function. So what would be a good idea to do? The good idea here would be to minimize the curvature of h, so to pick h as close as possible to a line already, so that way when you linearize, you're not losing much information. Um, and how do we do this? We minimize the curvature of h. And so the way, um, so curvature is a local property, so we wanted to come up with a global uh, kind of formulation of this, and this is how we came up with the idea of an undominated decomposition. So what is an undominated decomposition? So uh, G and H are an undominated decomposition of F, right? If you can't obtain any other decomposition of F, by subtracting something convex from h. Uh, so essentially, you're already, you can't get anything, you can't take anything convex out of h and get another valid decomposition. And so how does this translate, how does this impact the CCP algorithm? Well, if you remember, right, um, so this is our function, so this is the function we're interested in. So let's look at this on a toy example. So this is a function we're interested in, and we have two different decompositions, say of it, this orange decomposition and this gray decomposition here. So f is equal to g minus h and g prime minus h prime. Now this orange decomposition here is dominated by this gray decomposition here. Why is that? Because I can subtract x squared, right, from h here and obtain this decomposition here, which is still a valid decomposition. 
And on one iteration of the CCP algorithm, what does this look like? So this is my convexified version of F using the orange decomposition and this one using the gray decomposition. And remember that in our algorithm, we, use, we would take the minimum afterwards, right? And this gray curve here is lower than this orange curve. So it gives us a better minimum. So essentially taking an undominated decomposition gives us the next best thing to do in the CCP algorithm. It gives us the best possible thing we can do in one step. And how do we obtain this undominated decomposition? Well, it's actually the solution to the following optimization problem. And we've shown that um, such a solution always exists, so a dom undominated decomposition always exists too. So the, here we have, so this is the optimization problem in question. So here we have f is equal to g minus h, so that's a constraint. So we're looking for g and h, right? So we have f is equal to g minus h, g is convex, h is convex. So this is just asking, this is just giving me a feasible decomposition, right? And what is giving me the undominated part of it is the objective. Now, what is the objective? We have the Hessian of H, which is a matrix of polynomials. We take its trace, that gives us a polynomial. We integrate it over the sphere, uh, and that gives us uh, something that's linear in the coefficients of H, and that's the kind of problem that we're going to be solving. So actually, solving a problem of this type is hard due to the convexity condition. So what we're going to do is we're going to replace this convexity condition by a uh, SOS convexity condition, and this is going to be an, a semi-definite program to solve. So how does it perform in practice? So to compare if our decomposition actually works and gives us something valuable, what we did is we were interested in minimizing a function f0. So f0 has, uh, was generated randomly. It has eight variables, and it's of degree four. And we're minimizing it over a ball. And what we're going to do is we're going to decompose this function into two, uh, using two different tools. So one of them is just going to be a pure feasibility problem. The other one is going to be this undominated decomposition. So we're going to decompose it in two different ways. And then we're going to run this algorithm on the two different decompositions. We're going to stop it at four minutes and see uh, the objective value that we're going to get at the end. And of course, the lower the better, right? We're minimizing. So if the objective value is lower, then it would have performed better. And these are the results we get. So with feasibility here, uh, we're going to get a very high objective value. And with this undominated decomposition, we're actually getting uh, a a much lower um, objective value. So it shows that the performance of this algorithm is uh, strongly impacted by, by such a decomposition. And in fact, it might even be valuable for you if you already have such a decomposition to recompute one to actually get better results. So just to conclude, um, so I've shown you know, Hopefully, uh, I've convinced you that optimizing over non-negative non polynomials uh, has many applications. Here we saw two such applications in machine learning, so uh, monotone regression and difference of convex programming. So um, future directions that we have, and Amrali talked a little bit about the first one in his, in his talk, uh, is about you know, improving scalability of semi-definite programs. So semi-definite programs are notoriously you know, uh, not scalable. So uh, we've been working on, on algorithms to solve large-scale semi-definite programs. And the second one that we're interested in and that we're looking at currently is using these difference of convex programs ideas that I talked about uh, for sparse regression. So in this particular case, this is linear regression, right? So I'm trying to find um, at least squares fit. And then I have this regularizing condition. I want, to rep I want my, my solution to be sparse, so I'm adding the zero norm, right? And uh, traditionally, what we do is we replace this zero norm by a one norm, which is convex, and then we, we solve this problem. But it might be better to have, for example, a concave um, approximation, so a polynomial that approximates my norm zero instead of having a norm one that approximates my norm zero. And, um, but then this would become a non-convex uh, polynomial. And what we would do is we would use this algorithm to uh, obtain a decomposition of this polynomial and then use a CCP algorithm to obtain solutions to this problem. So those are future directions. Thanks very much. Questions or comments for Georgie? Okay. So I, the uniqueness part wasn't completely clear to me. So the uniqueness of the decomposition? Right. Okay. So you said, I guess, uh, so you identified a nice uh, way of writing by defining this new minimization. Uh, so let me let me go back. Are you talking about? I understand the short answer is no. The short answer is no. So it's it's very it's it's quite easy to see, right? So suppose you have this initial decomposition here, f is equal to g minus h, right? You can add if you have a convex and to pick your favorite convex polynomial, right? Add it onto g, add it onto h, they cancel each other out, so it's still equal to f, but it's another decomposition. But I guess the yeah. point, so later when you develop it, yes. it's, uh, 
so your, the question is whether the undominated decomposition is unique, I, I guess, yes. So actually, um, so in the case where, so okay, so in the quadratic case, for example, it's non-unique. Um, so uh, we can assume that undominated decompositions are not unique in general. So it will give you one such decomposition. So, so, so what is it in the quadratic case? I mean, so in the quadratic case, this undominated decompositions are not unique. There's a paper by Bomza where he shows that. They're not so you unique. don't get the splitting into positive. Like so that. that's one of them, but there are, there are others. I see. Yeah. I see. How, how do you compute the, the objective for the undominated? This like. Oh, so actually, there's there's well known uh, techniques for computing this integral. So there's again another paper actually that gives you explicit uh, the explicit the integral explicitly as a function of the coefficients. It's just. It's known, yeah. Do you have questions? So, so, so isn't any formal link between the quality of the decomposition? I mean, I guess you have in here for one step, right? Between yes. the quality yes. of the decomposition and how well the yeah. algorithm performs. Yeah, so this, is, so this is essentially a greedy method, right? So every step is the best thing to do. So there are no, we don't have any theoretical guarantees anyway as to like the, the experimentally is the only thing we have. But it seems to perform well experimentally. Okay. Other questions or comments? I have. Uh, on your regression problem, what was the loss function again? Oh, so this is just least squares. So, the, so okay. So, so least squares is a quadratic, I yeah. But the least squares justification is that it's the maximum likelihood for uh, for the normal distribution. When you impose uh, when you impose any kind of uh, condition like monotonicity. Then you are the the then the normal would not, I don't think the normal distribution would be appropriate because the the support is the entire space and here now you're saying some of the space is allowed so that yeah so we would so we, so if I understand your question correctly I we would restrict ourselves at least for the beginning on to the interval zero one um, was that your question no but I mean the 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 question it's just that the least squares is justifiable only. So when you're assuming the, the normal distribution on the on the para, on the parameter space. Sure. So this this was just an example, to be honest with you. You can replace by any polynomial loss that you that you prefer, and that will work. <coughs> Thank you, Georgina, again.